All right, everyone. Welcome back to our GWJDD Dermatology Translational Science Lecture Series. Um, I'd first like to thank our sponsors. Either this is a great representation how industry is so invested uh, in residency and, and, and just dermatology education, or they all just have a whopping academic crush on our speaker, uh, who is really an extraordinary physician scientist. Uh, Dr. Lloyd Miller is an associate professor of dermatology and orthopedic surgery, I think that's kind of a new combo, uh, at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Miller has an R01 funded laboratory where he investigates uh, innate immune response, specifically focusing on staph and MRSA, um, as well as wound healing. He has published extensively in the literature in high level journals, Journal of Clinical Investigation for one, and actually most recently was uh, elected to the American Society of Clinical Inve Investigation. For those who don't know, that is a huge deal, huge. Really, really huge deal. Um, teaches residents, which we were talking about earlier, really enjoys doing that. On a personal level, I've known Lloyd for about 13 years now, and even dating back to his time as a star resident at UCLA, clear rock star in science, uh, really strong science, though your jump shot, not so strong. Hope you've worked on that since then. Uh, so I'm really, really happy to, uh, to welcome you uh, for our lecture series. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Friedman, for that fine and very enthusiastic uh, introduction, Dr. Owen, for having me come here. It's a real pleasure to be um, here at GW. It's my first time here. Uh, these guys seem very difficult cases, so I'm very impressed. Um, so today, I'm going to talk about innate immunity. And I, I give the structure and function course and the immunology course at the AAD. And this is the first time I'm combining those two lectures. Um, to teach about like what's going on with the innate immune system, how it relates to skin disease, and, and how to translate what we're learning in basic science um, into the clinic. Um, so let's, hopefully we'll succeed in this. Um, I do have some uh, relevant, or, or actually I do have some support from grant support and a consultant through various industries, but actually nothing about uh, what I'm going to talk about today. Um, so the skin is really an amazing organ. It kind of is our barrier between our, our body and the whole environment. And you can do a very, very simple test in the lab. Um, so it's, if you take a Petri dish and you grow Staph aureus on that Petri dish, if you take your bare hand, and don't do this at home, but if you were in the lab and you take your bare hand and touch the plate of Staph aureus, and then touch a brand new plate of Petri dish and then culture that overnight, the Staph aureus can grow just fine on that dish. If you do that same experiment and you make a lawn of E. coli, touch the plate with your bare hand of E. coli, again, don't do this at home, but if you're touching E. coli and then touch a new plate and grow that overnight, nothing grows. And it shows like how the skin is, is kind of very good at uh, killing certain bacteria but not others. And the control for this experiment is if you take a, your hand and instead of using your bare hand, cover it with a glove, touch the plate of E. coli, and then touch a, a new plate of, uh, of uh, petri dish, the E. coli grows just fine. <coughs> so how does your skin kill E. coli so rapidly and not Staph aureus? And uh, that's really your innate immune system. So, um, so your skin has a real constitutive innate immunity, and uh, probably what's affecting that E. coli is what's going on at the surface of your skin. Um, so what's there are antimicrobial peptides, which I'm going to talk about in a lot of detail. The normal skin microbiome actually prevents pathogenic and other bacteria from entering. There's kind of a competition going there of the bacteria living on our skin, the bacteria trying to come in and invade our skin and, and pathogens. And the, actually the surface of the skin has a very low temperature and pH, and that is um, inhospitable to a lot of organisms. And after the barrier itself, uh, on the surface of the skin, we have the keratinocytes, uh, one of my favorite cells. And the keratinocytes themselves, they make a lot of antimicrobial peptides. There's some immune cells, like one hand cells, that actually reside in the epidermis. And the dermis is actually loaded with immune cells. There's even more T cells in your dermis than there are in your blood. And so if a pathogen was to bypass or get through these barriers, such as a wound, and deal with the dermis, you're talking about macrophages, mast cells, T cells, B cells, other cells that get activated. And that leads to recruitment of other immune cells, some of your classic innate immune cells like neutrophils that come in, just like you saw in that uh, pustular uh, psoriasis patient, the pustules can happen in the skin. Those are meant to uh, help combat pathogens and not meant to give you uh, pustular disease. Um, but we're gonna talk about these today. So what is innate immunity? So innate immunity is the early and rapid pro-inflammatory immune response, and it was initially thought to be nonspecific. Not very interesting if it was nonspecific. But now it's known that the innate immune um, system has actual specificity and is directed against these conserved 
uh, components of microorganisms, and they're called PAMPs, or pathogen-associated molecular patterns, that are very specific for microorganisms, but not self. And the host um, cellular uh, receptors that recognize these PAMPs are called pattern recognition receptors, um, a classic one being toll-like receptors, which we're going to talk about in a lot of detail. And the innate immune response can help direct your adaptive immune response. So I'm not going to talk anything about adaptive immunity in detail, but this is your T cells and your B cell antibody responses. The innate system can direct those responses and lead to either a productive uh, adaptive immune response or even autoimmunity in, in a barren condition. So this is the outline of my talk. I'm going to talk about soluble mediators of innate immunity, and I'm going to focus on antimicrobial peptides. Uh, next, we're going to go through some anti uh, pattern recognition receptors. We're going to focus on three different types of toll-like receptors. These are uh, nucleotide bondi binding oligomerization, that's some trouble saying that, uh, domain proteins, but NOD1 and NOD2, which are really interesting, and this newer, uh, very important innate immune mechanism called the inflammasome. And then finally, I'm going to end with just a very, I'm going to touch on some cellular innate immune responses um, that, that relate to the skin. And those I'm going to focus on keratinocytes and neutrophils. Okay, so let's talk. To, let's start with these soluble mediators, and I'm going to focus on antimicrobial peptides. So what are these? So these are like natural antibiotics. They're very short amino acid sequences, usually less than 40 or 50 amino acids long. There's almost 400 of these, and they're found in both plant and animal kingdoms. Um, and they're also they have an ancient lineage. And if you go back in the evolutionary spectrum to just like multicellular <laughs> organisms, their whole immune system is actually functioning on antimicrobial peptides. I'll talk about that in a little more detail. So these are very, very important, and they go back way on the evolutionary spectrum. And they have broad spectrum antimicrobial activity against bacteria, fungi, and viruses. And there's little development of resistance because they go to mechanisms that are inherent to microbes and not self. Um, so here's some examples. Um, this is uh, what, what the structure of an alpha defensin looks like. These are loaded in neutrophil granules. Um, this is beta defensins. These are made by the, the skin, the keratinocytes. And uh, this is granulysin, and this is one made by your T cells. And so they all have antimicrobial activity. So, let's, so how do they work? So the proposed mechanism of action is that they're, actually most of these are cationic. Uh, so they have a positive charge. And uh, most of them work is because microbes happen to have a very strong negative charge in their membrane. And so what happens is, is if you have your um, microbe here with this negatively charged membrane and an antimicrobial peptide here with a positive charge, those two will have a very strong interaction. And that antimicrobial peptide will actually intercalate into the cell membrane or cell wall of a microorganism. And, and that will lead to um, permeability and you get osmotic lysis. And uh, it causes death of uh, the microorganism. So that's kind of how it works. Um, there's one antibiotic on the market you might have heard of called daptomycin, works just like an antimicrobial peptide. It punches holes in the membranes of microbes. So these are you know, going to be coming into the clinic, and there's more on their way that I'll talk about. And that's how you get osmotic lysis. So um, these are the seven I want to focus on. Um, there's actually about 100 in the skin that are probably relevant. Uh, we don't have time to talk about those, but these are the ones I kind of want to focus on. So these are the ones made in the skin. So uh, beta fencins, which are mostly made by keratinocytes, um, this is the cellular source here. They also have these other properties, which makes them very, really interesting molecules, as, as for instance, beta fencins can cause hematoxis of T cells and dendritic cells to the skin. Um, Cathocytin, which is Rich Gallo's favorite one, but, uh, up at UCSD, he spent a career uh, studying cathocytin. Uh, it's made by many different cells um, in the skin, and it has many other functions, such as angiogenesis, hematoxis, it helps with wound healing. It's a very uh, multifunctional um, uh, antimicrobial peptide, and it's only 37 amino acids long. Uh, granulysin, which is made by T cells, can also cause chemotaxis of other immune cells, and it actually can lyse tumor cells. Uh, so those T cells that make granulysin have a, have a nice effect because they're cytotoxic to tumors. <coughs> and then this one called psoriasin, it was named because it's loaded in psoriasis scales, um, and that's made mostly by keratinocytes, and it can also have, uh, cause chemotaxis. So these are very interesting ones. Um, if you're taking the derm boards, there's one antimicrobial peptide found in high levels in sweat is dermcidin. It has real good activity against Staph aureus. Um, RNA7 is a newer one that's also made by keratinocytes with really good activity against a lot of pathogens in the skin. And then alpha defensins, which I mentioned briefly, those are only made by neutrophils. And uh, actually, mouse neutrophils don't have them, so I don't study them in my lab. But human neutrophils do. And they have four different types, and they're really important in neutrophil host defense. So as I mentioned, they, if you look at the group as a whole against um, all these different gram-positive, gram-negative, and fungi organisms, they pretty much all have pluses here. 
So they have broad spectrum antimicrobial activity against vast arrays of bacteria and fungi. So they're pretty, they're very, very uh, neat in that they, they have such broad spectrum activity. Um, and what, I just want to mention that some of these are controlled by other immune mechanisms such as IL-1 and NF-kappa B and toll-like receptors. In the case of human beta defense in 2, it can increase the expression of, of uh, human beta defense in 2. Um, human beta defense in 3 is interestingly regulated by growth factors. And this goes up uh, when you see a lot of growth factors in wounds and there's a lot of growth factors in psoriasis. You see very, very high levels of human beta defense in 3. Um, Cathocidin was kind of neat, and I'll talk about this earlier, it has two uh, vitamin D response elements in this promoter. And vitamin D actually regulates this entire antimicrobial peptide. It's very important for human host defense. Okay, so um, let's talk about antimicrobial peptides and atopic dermatitis. This is one of the first examples, um, so let's talk about atopic derm. I guess I don't need to introduce this too much, but we see it in kids and adults. Uh, mostly in kids, 5% of adults, and it's itchy. Uh, in adults, you see it in amphicubia fossa. There's an acute form, a chronic form. Um, and one of the biggest components of atopic dermatitis, it's not shown on here, but when you see patients uh, with these honey colored crusts, and I'm sure you see them with a the flare of atopic derm, that is staph aureus on the skin of atopic dermatitis patients. And you know, we treat these patients with bleach baths and antibiotics to try and get that bacterial burden down. Um, but why does Staph aureus grow so much on the skin of atopic derm dermatitis patients? They're actually found in almost in a million or a hundred thousand uh, CFUs of Staph aureus on the lesional skin of an atopic derm patient, which is which is a hundred to a thousand fold more than their non-lesional skin. That is an enormous amount of bacteria in the in the skin of these patients. So. One of the reasons why they think this occurs, um, this, this paper was published in the New England Journal. Um, I'm actually going to scroll through this. But they were basically looking at uh, levels of human beta defense in 2 and cathelicidin in uh, psoriasis patients at the top. Let me scroll through this. Um, and um, so psoriasis patients, normal patients, chronic atopic derm, acute atopic derm. And what they found was is that human beta defense in 2 was very highly expressed in psoriasis, more so than normal almost a whole lack of expression in atopic dermatitis. And then they looked at calthocidin, it's also called LL37, 37 amino acids long. It is through the roof in psoriasis, more than normal, and it's down-regulated in atopic dermatitis. And atopic dermatitis in general is missing these antimicrobial peptides. That's why they think the bacteria are so easily stick to the skin of these patients, because they're missing all the antimicrobial peptide response. Um, later on, after this paper, it was shown that the TH2 cytokine profile is uh, actually downregulates the production of antimicrobial peptides. So that's one mechanism they think that TH2 environment in atopic derm is actually regulating uh, or downregulating the antimicrobial peptides. So this is an example of how it's important in a, in a very relevant skin disease. It's also relevant in rosacea. Um, so we all know about this um, erythrotelangiectatic subtype. Uh, they can get more puscular um, in rosacea. Nobody knows what really causes this disease, but there was this really interesting uh, Nature Medicine paper, this was again done by Rich Gallo's group, where they were looking at the skin, and they were looking at this antimicrobial peptide cathocidin. And what they found was is that in rosacea, there was a massive amount of expression of cathocidin in the skin. And then there's this enzyme here called a, a stratum corneum triptic enzyme, this SCTE, which was also found through the roof in rosacea skin compared to normal skin, and they co-localized with each other in the epidermis. And uh, so, so how do these two things relate, and how do they cause disease? So what they found was, it's basically in normal skin, you have this cathocidin precursor that needs to be cleaved, and that's normally done by this SETE enzyme. And then you get LL37, the normal, uh, um, antimicrobial peptide, and that has these chemotactic, angiogenic, and it's bacterial cytal, and you get an effective immune response. But what happens in our rosacea, um, so you have the cathocidin precursor, but you have massive upregulation of that enzyme. And that leads to not just LL37, but all these cleaved byproducts, which have all these aberrant activity, and so you get massive issues with increased pro-inflammatory activation, and that's what they think is causing chronic inflammation in rosacea. So uh, they're actually trying to target this clinically. Um, we'll see if this ends up on the market, but targeting uh, the increased cathocidin variant peptides, as well as this enzyme uh, SCTE. Um, so yeah, so that's one of the reasons why I think it's involved in rosacea. So here's some examples of some antimicrobial peptides that are in ongoing in clinical trials. I'll just highlight a few. 
Um, so this one, pexidanum, is thought to have antimicrobial activity. It's now uh, just finished phase three for diabetic foot ulcers to prevent infections of those. Um, and there's other topical ones that are they're using as like skin antiseptics, or they're going to bathe them in catheters before they insert them, almost as natural antibiotics. Um, this one, they're putting in a phase, this I think is now in phase two, to actually put an antimicrobial peptide in a patient's nose, kind of like how we use mupiracin to decolonize patients, using an antimicrobial peptide just like mupiracin to decolonize from MRSA. Um, there's a similar one that has really good activity against Canada, so that they're going to try and decrease Canada, especially in HIV patients with rush. Uh, and there's even one against hepatitis. So I think uh, we're going to see these on the market soon. This is a whole new class of essentially natural antibiotics. Um, okay, any questions about antimicrobial peptides? Yes? Has there been shown any resistance to any of these? So there are. So, I mean, if you take the example of Staph aureus and you, you wonder, you know, if these evolved at the same time why patients were colonized, um, Staph aureus makes enzymes that even are meant just cleave these. <laughs> so there's proteases that cleave caplicidin, for instance. And so different bugs have different ways to try and get around um, a lot of these antimicrobial peptides. But because there's so many different antimicrobial peptides and they're hitting the bugs from different ways, it's hard for the bug to actually get all of them. Uh, but certainly we get infected, so they're not totally effective all the time. So there's definitely different mechanisms of resistance. I think the first antimicrobial peptide described was here at GW, George Washington, uh, Magenin, um, found in frog skin, and uh, Magen being Hebrew for shield, and there was a, a group here that, that did that that's initial really work. That's great. I didn't know that. I'm going to have to look that up. That's really cool. Good to know. Okay. And then the premise was, why don't frogs who swim in a lot of polluted water ever get skin infections? <laughs> so it was a skin paper, so it's in the frog skin. That's great. Yes, yes. So I'm going to have to look that one up and add it to the top. <laughs> Red frogs from getting infected. Okay, so let's move on to pattern recognition receptors. And these exploded in the past, uh, since, since, since the, in about the last 20 years. And the discovery started in, in Drosophila. Um, this was a really an amazing discovery. So why study flies? And I'm not going to show many animal models, but I'm going to show flies. So Drosophila are really interesting because they have no adaptive immune system. They don't make antibodies. They don't have T cells. And if you take a moment and think about everywhere a fly lands, it must have a pretty good immune system, maybe even better than a frog. I don't know. But <laughs> in this case, uh, what, what they found was is that the, they make Drosophila with, uh, that are completely deficient in this molecule called toll. Um, the Drosophila, you can see this is loaded with hyphae. This is actually aspergillus. Uh, it can't handle an aspergillus infection. All the flies die very rapidly if they don't have an active toll molecule. So what is toll? There's a long mechanism here. Um, what I'm going to focus on is basically there's a system here, and this is similar in humans, which I'll go through, where bacteria or fungi can be recognized. And toll is found in the membrane, and toll uh, basically recognizes the, the, these pathogenic bacteria, signals through mid 88 which is an adapter molecule. Sorry to throw a lot of new molecules at you, but that's about <laughs> all the two things you need to know, toll and mid 88 And um, you get basically production of this antimicrobial peptide called drosomycin, which has activity against aspergillus. And if you don't have toll, you lose this whole antimicrobial peptide response and the flies die. Um, so this led to the Nobel Prize uh, by Jules Hoffman from the Cell Paper in 2011. It was awarded. Um, and why it was so important is because they actually, after the study, they said, well, if coal exists in flies, do they exist in humans? And they do. And they have homology, and these are called toll like receptors because they're similar to the original toll discovered in Drosophila. Um, so what are toll like receptors? These are classic pattern recognition receptors. There's 11 known in humans, only one through 10 can signal. There's 14 in mice, different species have different numbers of these. Um, and each one is really interesting because they each recognize a different uh, pathogen associated molecular pattern. I'm gonna go through that in detail in a second. And these PAMPs, um, these patterns are predominantly expressed by microorganisms which allow the toll-like receptors and all other pattern recognition receptors to initiate immune responses um, against pathogens rather than self. However, if you think about it, if the toll-like receptors are acting against self-components, self you can end up in autoimmunity. And there are toll-like receptors that recognize things like DNA and RNAs that are thought to be involved in like lupus pathogenesis and other autoimmune diseases. So toll-like receptors can be good, but they can also be bad if they're apparently activated. 
Um, this slide goes through the different um, camps that these toll-like receptors activate. Um, these are not super important to know, but um, basically toll-like receptor 2 can bind to toll-like receptor 1 or 6 and form these heterodimers that bind to bacterial mycopeptides, very importantly gram-positive bacteria and mycobacteria. Um, toll-like receptor 4 was the first one characterized. They never knew how LPS or endotoxin activated cells. It's actually through toll-like receptor 4 that mediates sepsis. Um, that was a major finding, the first one characterized. Toll-like receptor 5 is binds to bacterial flagellin. Um, and then you have these ones that bind to the double-stranded RNA, like toll-like receptor 3, single-stranded RNA, like toll-like receptor 7, and toll-like receptor 8, and uh, single-stranded uh, DNA in the case of toll-like receptor 9. They're still working out what toll-like receptor 10 and 11 are doing. Um, does anyone know of an agonist we use for toll-like receptor we use in clinic every day? Imiquimod. Imiquimod, good. Imiquimod. This was released on the market before we knew, uh, right there, toll-like receptor 7 agonist of how it worked. We knew it made a lot of interferon. No one knew how it worked, but actually it works through toll-like receptor 7. Um, but what I want to focus on here is all the toll-like receptors signal through mitated family adapters, just like in the Drosophila. So this is very important because it's conserved through evolution. Um, and it can have different outcomes. Um, so in a good immune response, you can increase phagocytosis, you can make antimicrobial <coughs> peptides, just like in the Drosophila. So uh, that's a very important way toll-like receptors act. They can direct the adaptive immune response, the T cell mediated, cell mediated immunity, or antibody production. And then in aberrant conditions, they could be involved in septic shock, autoimmunity, and in uh, cell death, such as apoptosis, and actually cause tissue injury. So they can be good and bad. Okay. So this was an interesting finding. It was found by my postdoctoral mentor, Robert Malden, when it was at UCLA. I think this is really cool. This paper's been cited in, from science over 500 times now. Um, so what they found is they were looking at toll-like receptor 2 here, and they found out when they activated it, it did something very interesting. And the two highest genes that were the transcripts that were activated were the vitamin D receptor and the CYP27B1, which was found in the mitochondria. And these two are actually linked, and it was this a very important immune pathway that they found. So in our bloodstream, we have vitamin D. We get vitamin D from the sun. Uh, everyone knows it gets activated by the kidneys. It did 125 uh, vitamin D3. And that's our active form of vitamin D. But actually in a macrophage, you can do the same thing with this enzyme. You can convert the 25D3 circulating in our blood to active vitamin D3. And that can now bind to the receptor because both of these are upregulated. And now you get this massive vitamin D response in a macrophage. And what they found out is that led to these massive induction of cathelicidin. Um, and cathelicidin um, is an antimicrobial peptide that has these vitamin D response elements in its promoter. And they found out that had major killing activity against MTV, the tuberculosis, as well as leprosy. Um, so this had a lot, this is a very interesting paper, because what happens is, is they never knew why dark-skinned individuals, African-Americans, were highly susceptible to tuberculosis. It turns out that in the serum, of, uh, because people wear clothes now and the dark skin prevents the sun exposure, a lot of African-Americans are now uh, vitamin D deficient. And they found the most, so they did a lot of um, experiments by putting the serum from dark skinned people that are vitamin D deficient with people that were vitamin C sufficient. And this made a huge difference in the killing of, t and, of, t of tuberculosis in culture. So this might explain why um, uh, dark skinned people that are vitamin D deficient are more susceptible to infections. Um, if you go way back, another Nobel Prize, 1907, there was a Nobel Prize awarded for um, solariums, or treating TB with getting sunlight. And they opened up all over the US. Uh, people were kind of sitting out in the sun, baking in the sun. And this could be the mechanism of making increased cathelicidin because of all the vitamin D. And what happened was, is uh, the, the solariums got very popular, but they also got very fancy. And they wanted to do them in different parts of the, of, uh, the US. So they, they put glass up around them. And the glass blocked the UV light, and all the solarium effects stopped working. So they actually stopped using them. Um, so that might be, that's just a fun fact. <laughs> so it's interesting. So how else do we know, what, how else can antimicrobial peptides and toll-like receptors lead to disease? A perfect example is psoriasis. We saw this patient with possible pustular psoriasis today. Um, but we know the environmental triggers, um, some people say group A strep infection, but there's other triggers that we still don't quite understand. But they, they damage the keratinocytes. And what happens when you damage keratinocytes you actually release a lot of the and the L37, that kind of sit in the keratinocytes, and you release a lot of DNA. 
And it turns out that these two form a very, very potent complex. And the LL37, the cathocytin, can actually um, shuttle the DNA inside these dendritic cells. And that leads to activation of toll-like receptor 9, which, which recognizes the DNA. And then you get activation of other dendritic cells, which eventually cause T cells become Th1 and Th17 cells. And they think this is how you initiate psoriasis. So you start with damage of the keratinocytes to an antimicrobial peptide in DNA, then you have a toll-like receptor signal. And so these early innate signals are, in this case, initiating an aberrant um, autoimmune response that's helped initiate um, uh, 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 psoriasis in this case, and autoimmune disease. So there's a lot of skin diseases that they think are associated with microbiome changes, which are related to antimicrobial peptides on the skin and toll -like receptors. Um, just here's just some examples. I'm not going to go through these in a lot of detail, but um, in acne, we, we see upregulation of certain antimicrobial peptides as well as toll -like receptors, which could lead to a barren activation. Um, Jenny Kim, when I was at UCLA, helped identify TOL2, which can act, which is recognized as the P. acnes bacteria. It can recognize lipopeptides from that bacteria that can increase inflammation and acne. Um, atopic dermatitis, which I mentioned earlier, so very low levels of cathocyanin in human beta defense ends, and that leads to all that colonization on the skin. Um, in psoriasis, we actually have upregulation of a lot of antimicrobial peptides, and IL-17 can actually induce a lot of these antimicrobial peptides. And that may be why we don't see so many infections in the skin in psoriasis. So if you compare psoriasis to atopic dermatitis, we don't really see the, the colonization, uh, the impetigenization. We don't see a lot of abscesses in psoriasis. And that could be because of the uh, upregulation of toll-like receptors and antimicrobial peptides. And as I mentioned earlier, rosacea with the, with the calipine fiber, the STCE enzyme, and those uh, LF37 variants. They also have an upregulation of toll-like receptor too. Okay. Let me go through this. I want to spend a little time on this slide. So one of the things I mentioned is that these innate signals can direct an adaptive immune response, and we can use that, if you think about it, for vaccine adjuvants. Uh, so that's one thing that, uh, that may be a good way to translate of what we're learning in basic science. So certain things that like bind to toll-like receptor 4 and other toll-like receptors here, um, and, or endosomals ones. So the ones found on endosomes are the ones that recognize DNA and RNA, uh, the ones on the surface recognize like lipopeptides or endotoxin. And they, they can actually cause a, uh, an antigen presenting cell to either lead to a cell mediated immune response, such as making Th1 cells, or some of them can actually induce B cell responses. So if you think about it, if you hit an adjuvant with an antigen for a vaccine, you can actually direct what type of immune response you would like against a certain pathogen. Um, so here's a whole list of these on the market that are coming. So uh, there's lipid A, which is that the TOL4 agonist, which are all the TOL5 agonist. Um, these are now looking at for vaccine adjuvants. Um, all these are TOL4 agonists. This one does 4 and 9. Must be a really interesting molecule. Um, and then there's double-stranded RNA molecules that are targeting TOL-like receptor 3. Um, so all these vaccine adjuvants are going to come on the market. There's single-stranded RNA ones, just like a Miplomod, activating TOL-like receptor 7 and 8. Um, they're even using Aldera, actually, as a vaccine adjuvant, and that gets mainly a Th1 response. Um, down here, we have a toll-like receptor 9 adjuvants. These are becoming much more popular, these, these DNA molecules. So they're all in clinical trials, so I think you'll eventually see these on the market. Um, any questions about toll-like receptors? Yes? So most of these are on keratinocytes, or can you find them? All on, over. All over. All cells. So, all so, immune cells and okay. keratinocytes. Okay. So these vaccines aren't necessarily um, epidermal or intradermal vaccines. They could be... They could be intramuscular, too. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in this case, I was just showing what an antigen-presenting cell can do on the previous slide, and it expresses all the toll-like receptors. So those are the ones interacting with the T cells through the MHC molecules and helping direct those responses. So you probably want to hit these guys, but you're right. You're hitting the surrounding stromal cells, the keratinocytes, and those are also releasing cytokines. And depending on the environment, you, you'll get, <laughs> depends on what immune response you want to generate, but certainly it'll make a difference, you know, how, how you hit these cells with the different adjuvants. Would, would blocking a toll receptor be too far upstream in terms of, you know, being a, a drug will target? You know, but blocking a toll receptor two, you know, the negatives that way, the benefits of doing that, something like that, where you have an auto-inflammatory disease. Yeah, so, so I, I don't know of a TOL2 blocking. I, I know, so in um, lupus, they know that TOL9 is really, really important because it recognizes DNA. 
And uh, they're looking at ways to block toll 9 for lupus patients. So um, yes, yeah, so when these are apparently activated in autoimmunity, that is something they're also looking at. Um, I didn't talk about that today, but I can definitely add that to the talk. It's, it's a good point. Um, let me move on to these newer mo uh, molecules called NODs. Um, so what are they? So I just went through this uh, toll-like receptors, which are found on the membrane, kind of insane in the membrane, if you remember that. Um, they signal through my DNA. But what, what if a pathogen or pathogen components get, they're not on a membrane or in an endosome? We have these other um, molecules um, here, NOD1 and NOD2, that are in the cytoplasm. And these are pattern recognition receptors that are just floating in the cytoplasm. Um, NOD1 here recognizes um, this, let me see if I take a stab at it. Uh, gamma D glucamol, this one, <laughs> um, IE DAP, um, which is a breakdown product of gram negative peptidoglycan, and um, NOD2 recognizes a breakdown product called meramyl dipeptide, that one I can't pronounce, of uh, gram positive bacteria. So if you're a bacterium and you have peptidoglycan, which all bacteria do, you can be recognized by NOD1 and NOD2, and actually get a very similar signaling effect, and you get these massive uh, pro inflammatory response. So that's the, these are our, our, this is a very hot area of our research that's going on. So let's talk about these. I'm actually going to focus on NOD2 just because I think it's more interesting. So they found out that there's these active, activating mutations of TOL2. The first ones were identified in Crohn's disease. So Crohn's disease patients, uh, which have massive you know, of gut inflammation, they actually have activating NOD2 uh, mutations. Actually, most patients have this. Uh, Blau syndrome, which is this uh, newer disease, maybe it's in our derm textbooks, it's a skin disease. Um, so it's an autosomal dominant familial granulomatous disease. You've got arthritis, iritis, uveitis, and a rash. I'll show some pictures of this. I think I have it on this slide. No pulmonary involvement, so it's not like sarcoid. Um, and it usually have these painless tiny red dots and generalized distribution. Uh, the rash comes and goes but can resolve spontaneously. And later on it was found out that other granulomatous diseases have the odd two mutations too, like sarcoid, uh, as well as some graft versus host disease that's been associated. Uh, later on it was also associated with uh, uh, lipomatous leprosy. So NOD2 seems to be, if it's overactive, you kind of get granulomatous disease. Really interesting. Okay, so this is Blau syndrome. I just want to show you some pictures of that generalized papular dermatitis in this young child here. Um, and in histology, you see this uh, lymphocyte infiltration, um, it would, but it's really granulomatous inflammation. So NOD2 <laughs> must have something to do with generating a granulomatous response. I think it's pretty cool and it relates to Blau syndrome. Um, that's all I'm going to talk about NODs. Does anyone have any questions about those? Kind of our intracellular sensor for, for microbial components or peptidoglycan breakdown products. Okay, I want to talk about inflammasomes. This I study in my lab all the time, I'm not showing any data, but I think this is a really <coughs> cool mechanism. There was a, a New England Journal article that uh, titled these the linebacker of host defense. So you're bringing in those big 300 pound guys to this is what you're, this is what you're bringing in with the inflammasome. So what is it? So I just spent the whole time talking about pattern recognition receptors, which are on this side. So th this is found out to be a signal one and signal two. And you need two hits to get basically, and what do you need two hits for is to make uh, active IL-1 beta. So this whole response is to make IL-1 beta. So let me explain how this works. So signal one can be a toll-like receptor or a cytokine receptor such as TNF, and that causes activation, or, or, or NOD, NOD1 and NOD2 can also be a signal one, and you get NF-kappa B and pro-inflammatory cytokines. And you make a ton of cytokines when you activate those. However, IL-1 beta is made as a pro-cytokine, and it actually has no activity and cannot leave the cell unless the pro-sequence in the N-terminal domain is cleaved. And that cleaved um, process is done by an enzyme, it's not on this slide, but it's called caspase-1. And caspase-1 is not activated by signal-1. So you actually have to have this entirely other signal-2 to get caspase-1 activated to release IL-1 beta, or you don't get any IL-1 beta. Uh, this was frustrating for scientists for years who would stimulate cells and your transcripts for, R for IL-1 beta would go through the roof, but you do an ELISA and a supernatant and nothing's there. So uh, what they found out, if you add ATP or other elements, um, that's your signal <coughs> too. And what they found out, and a lot of things can activate it, uh, poor forming toxins, I study Staph aureus, the ones that poke holes in cells, they can activate the inflammasome, cholera toxin, candida itself, uh, bacterial RNA, influenza virus, the M2 protein can do it. But what is, um, what is consistent about, or what, where all these converge, is all these poke holes in called membrane instability. That causes a potassium <laughs> efflux. 
And then you get activation of this inflammasome, which is basically a complex of proteins that form together and they form oligomers. And if you study this under these high resolution super microscopy techniques, you can actually see multiple thousands of these form in the cell. It's an amazing phenomenon that happens when these uh, oligomerize and you get activation of xenolarp 3 inflammasome, which sole purpose is to make caspase 1 active. And at that point, you actually get maturation of IL-1 beta. The same process is true of IL-18, and now those are active and can be secreted from the cell. So why is this important? Um, so we talked about skin diseases associated with IL-1. Um, here's a bunch of examples. So these are these auto-inflammatory diseases, these now three mutations. Ed Cowan is studying these because he loves Anakinra. They work really well against these diseases. Um, but you get a lot of skin disease. You get rashes. You can get um, a, a conjunctival injection with these. We'll go this in a little more detail. So we have a lot of inhibitors of these. I'm not going to talk about them in general, but they're all different. So you have antibodies against IL-1 beta. You have Anakinra, which is an IL-1 receptor antagonist. So, so it's a competitive inhibition of the IL-1 receptor and you have other different newer uh, things to block IL-1 beta. And um, these are used um, against these chiropyrin diseases. Um, chiropyrin is another name for that analog between inflammasome. Um, so what they found out in these diseases, um, and, and you may know of some of these, like muckle well syndrome, or uh, familiar Mediterranean fever, and these other ones are this chiropyrin-associated periodic syndrome. Here they're chronic infantile neurologic cutaneous and articular syndrome. But these basically have the NLRP3 inflammasome on. So you are cle have cleaved caspase 1, I mean, you know, caspase 1 active always. So you're constantly cleaving your IL-1 beta, and your IL-1 beta is chronically released. And that causes this massive amount of IL-1 beta. And it turns out if you target a blockade of IL-1 beta, you actually get a lot of benefit in diseases. And Ed's really shed some really beautiful uh, papers on this. Um, you had that great patient today, maybe with a pustulosis. It happens to work in those diseases too. IL-1 um, IL ha happens to be a very potent neutrophil recruitment um, cytokine, and that might be how it's working. So if you can stop all that ex excess neutrophil recruitment, we might have some effect against things like Papa syndrome, safe L, maybe hidratinitis, uh, suppurativa. Um, so those are the inhibitors. Okay, let's get back to this side. So inflammasome, this is really interesting. So there's one FDA approved adjuvant right now that's been used for 50 years, um, and it's an inflammasome activator, alum. So aluminum hydroxide, um, which we use as a vaccine adjuvant, they never knew how it worked. It turns out it turns on the inflammasome, and that's the mechanism of action. And it primarily leads to a Th1 and Th17 response, and you also get antibodies with this one as well. So when you activate the inflammasome, you can actually induce both T cells and antibodies. And that's why it's so effective. Um, so that's right here. So aluminum salts. And they're actually looking at some other ones, uh, not just the old aluminum hydroxide like alum, but other ones do it even better. Um, so if you think about it, uh, there's a whole field of looking at aluminum salts. Um, one other disease I want to mention that's really interesting with the inflammasome um, is uh, gout. So the uric acid crystals actually poke holes in the membrane and are actually a potent inducer of the inflammasome as well. And it turns out gouty arthritis is all mediated by uh, those <laughs> uric acid crystals activating the inflammasome and making all that IL-1. So it's a nice uh, translational, uh, <coughs> translational of, of the inflammasome. Okay, and um, I just want to end the talk for some cellular innate immune responses. It looks like I'm on time. So my favorite two cells I'm going to talk about, one is keratinocytes. So keratinocytes, they're right in our epidermis. They're, again, at the barrier between the environment and us. They actually have all the toll-like receptors expressed on them. The toll-like receptors 1 through 5, uh, 1 through 6, excuse me, on the, on, the, on, the, um, on the cellular membrane and in the endosome. They have those ones that recognize as RNA and DNA in the endosome, like toll-like receptors 3, 7, and 9. Um, in addition, um, and those lead to antimicrobial peptides, cytokines, chemokines, so our keratinocytes can actually recognize all those bacterial components to help initiate that early immune response. Um, in addition, keratinocytes express the inflammasomes. You can actually get a lot of IL-1 beta. And uh, here, UV light um, and other stimuli, toxins, irritants, um, bacterial components can actually activate this inflammasome and that leads to active IL-1 beta. So keratinocytes can be an important source of this early inflammatory mediators that help promote immunity to the skin. And finally, what a lot of things do, like I mentioned IL-1 beta, it helps recruit neutrophils. Neutrophils were considered a classic innate immune system cell. Um, these, these come in, this is really uh, a very important immune response. I study these in my lab all the time. 
but uh, so they have FC receptors on the surface that can opsonize bacteria like Staph aureus. They also have complement receptors which do the same thing, they opsonize bacteria. And then bacteria or fungi or whatever the pathogen is can end up in like a phagosome. And the neutrophil has multiple mechanisms to kill bacteria. So when you're calling in neutrophils, you're really calling in a very potent immune system cell. Um, if you think about it, I always like to ask people, like, what would, like if you, if, what would you rather have? If you have severe combined immune deficiency and you have no adaptive immunity, no T cells or B cells, those are, the, those are the kids that live in the bubble. And would you rather have that disease or would you rather be neutropenic? And then, in the, oh, what, do you, what do you guys think? How many for severe combined immune deficiency? <laughs> <laughs> right, so the right answer is you, you would rather actually have severe combined immune deficiency because those pain patients can actually live a normal life. If you're neutropenic, like think about your chemotherapy patients you see on the rounds where their white cell count goes to zero, you get pneumonia with no neutrophil, you can die in like three days. So um, it's very, very important you have a very good neutrophil count. So we, you know, realize that these are very important in host defense. So we know uh, NADPH oxidase and oxygen killing can occur inside the phagosome. It is loaded with these alpha defensins that help kill bacteria. There's proteases and acid hydrolases. And there's these really cool proteins that sequester or punch nutrients like iron. They prevent the bugs from getting iron. And uh, what's in the neutrophil that's also really underappreciated is calprotectin. That's S100, A7, and A8 complex. Um, that's actually makes up 50% of the protein in a neutrophil. It's an antimicrobial peptide. It sequesters manganese and zinc and lets the, lets the pathogen can't get those essential nutrients. And it helps kill them. Um, so it's a really important immune response. And um, with that, um, I will end my talk and thank you for your attention. bleach baths and so I'm now reading things where people are anti bleach baths because they think it's increasing the pH so you're sort of like being counterproductive so now I don't know what to do so <laughs> bleach baths. I, I, mean, I don't know what the right thing to do is with atopic dermatitis certainly the, the bacterial burden is really high we, we have a uh, pill map here <laughs> so you wonder if, if with these newer medications that are blocking those th2 cytokines that allow maybe the normal antimicrobial peptides to be on the surface that will decrease the burden there may be better ways to do it than, than like a broad spectrum bleach splash which actually kills everything uh rich gallo actually when, when he got interviewed by the new york times he said maybe we shouldn't be washing our hands anymore because you're actually getting rid of your normal flora too but um, I don't know, I, I wash my hands. Uh, along, the lines of, <laughs> yes, well, along the lines of bleach baths, some of my contact friends, germ friends, are, um, there's, and who also do AD, uh, I think some of the issue with a bleach bath is maybe we're tinkering too much in one direction with the skin pH. So what they're doing is they're doing like two, three days of bleach baths, and then two, three days of blue apple, cider vinegar bath and, and they're actually getting better results with their AD kids really doing that combination. Yeah. So along that line, um, we know that the bleach bath will go ahead and kill most of the bacteria there or many bacteria. Do we know that whether it affects the toll-like receptors on the keratinocytes? I don't think it's been looked at. Um, but also with this notion of the uh, bleach bath, that typically we, we try to eradicate bacteria and as you allude to, there's also a thought that maybe we should restore a, a hospitable environment for the uh, normal micro microbial flora. And two ways to do that could be to either um, return the pH to slightly acidic, or I have heard someone uh, quoted as saying, uh, why not go ahead and make um, a moisturizer that actually has some of the normal bacteria in there, and to use that, and if you could return the skin to its normal flora, maybe those would also have their own antimicrobial actions that would prevent the secondary infections. Yeah, there's a whole field on microbiome changes and having the normal flora fight off pathogenic bacteria. Um, interesting, there's a company in Boston, I, I don't remember the name, it's probably not important, but they, they, they found out like a human skin, when you use soap, we actually eliminate a ton of these urease producing bacteria. 
And so they're putting that bacteria in this, uh, you know, in like a moisturizing cream, and it's actually preventing like colonization by Staph aureus. It's so, bias. Yeah, so there's yes. a company that's doing this. And so it's, I mean, there may be other companies. So you think of like a probiotic for your stomach to get your gut flora more diverse. We may need something like that for the skin too, and who knows what's going to hit the market. But certainly things we normally do, like you know, you use soap, are actually changing your microbiome. Um, and some of it may be killing off a good protective commensal bacteria. Uh, we all use Purell now, you're doing the same thing on your hands, you're not just getting the pathogens, you're also getting uh, your normal protective flora as well. It'd be nice to have something more specific. Fabulous talk, I loved it. Well, so thank you, thank you so much. Um, just one quick follow-up on Dr. Norton's comment. Actually, with bleach, we do know that it affects NF-kappa B. Um, so there are studies that look at that. So I don't know specifically the toleric receptor, but it definitely um, decreases some of kappa B effects, which is why they're actually looking for CLN having applications and other sort of inflammatory conditions. And one of the things that people are debating about bleach with its um, improvement in atopic derm is, is it truly just the antimicrobial you know, component of it, or is there also an anti-inflammatory component to it which the, with this end of kappa B pathway. So I think it's yet to be totally elucidated, but um, there's some research I think at Stanford they're looking at, you know, the CLN and they're looking at bleach with end of kappa B for other inflammatory conditions and it's one of the things people are, um, you know, trying to figure out why it's working in, in atopic norm patients. So, so just to that, that point, out. that's where pH is so important because what they're looking at is hypochlorous acid, which will only exist at a pH between 5.5 and 6.5. So with bleach, so hypochlorite, hypochlorous acid, chlorine gas, depending on the pH, you'll get one of those. So you know, if you have more basic pH, it just stays chloride. It doesn't go to hypochlorous acid. It's actually hypochlorous acid that will inhibit the inhibitor of uh, anti kappa B. So if you use hypochlorous acid, you will actually inhibit anti kappa B, which is removing the inhibitor of the inhibitor. That makes sense. I know that's <laughs> <laughs> I'm a riddle and an I actually have a question, you know, from the vitamin D slide you brought up, you know, we, we live in an era where tanning bed industry is saying, go out, you know, come to us, get your vitamin D from sun, and that's how you get your systemic vitamin D. Now, what you showed, vitamin D is important in the native immune response. Could we argue that it's really an injury response, that you're making vitamin D, because obviously, you know, toilet receptors are activated also, not just from pathogens, but also damaged keratinocytes. And could that be a way of repairing, you know, from sun exposure, rather, oh, we need vitamin D from sun exposure? Is that a, yeah, is that a, is that a fair so, argument? I so, guess? If you, so if you look at all the vitamin D literature, um, like you need vitamin, so look at skin pigmentation. There's a theory out there that um, most dark-skinned individuals live around the equator. Um, but if you look where very, very light-skinned individuals are, they, you know, back 10,000 years ago when we migrated or whatever that was, they're mostly at very high latitudes. And they think there was a reason for that is there's a very strong evolutionary pressure um, to get vitamin D because the, or otherwise the dark-skinned people would develop rickets because they didn't have enough vitamin D from their diet. Um, so if you didn't have light skin to absorb sun at those very high latitudes, uh, the human body could not support a pregnancy. So that's how they think light skinned people end up in very high latitudes and dark skinned people stayed around the equator, all because of sunlight. And there's few exceptions. One is uh, Eskimos. They love cod. They have a lot of fish. They thought that that was their, they're getting their vitamin D to live up there. So vitamin D has multiple effects, important for the bones. Um, I'm a dermatologist, I never get sun. My vitamin D levels would be, I, I actually take vitamin D based on uh, Dr. Modlin's recommendation. He takes 4,000 units a day, I'm right up there with him. Uh, but I don't get enough sun. Uh, and so otherwise you get to be vitamin D deficient. I think that affects your immune system. It, 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 it downregulates some immune system activities. It upregulates your cathocytin. So there's a whole new literature on vitamin D. So it's very important to get vitamin D. I don't recommend repeated sunburns or repeated tans, but you can actually take vitamin D orally to get your vitamin D levels uh, up to normal. Uh, to be vitamin D sufficient, I think is important. We all know vitamin D, I don't know if you guys are checking vitamin D for hair loss, we also check that in our patients. Vitamin D deficient mice actually have no hair. So it's also important for hair. Was, it, was your question how, if you think the trigger is actually the damage yeah, to the keratinocyte that's yeah, triggering so that? UV light causes, I mean, activates the inflammasone, it damages the keratinocyte, certainly getting local damage to the skin, which, which also probably not good for skin cancer, and you get, um, you know, that definitely changes in your DNA. 
So um, this local chronic uh, exposure to inflammation and UV light, I think, would more likely lead to um, damage. And then what do we do for our patients with psoriasis? So psoriasis, you're putting them in UV light. And in that case, they found out UV light and vitamin D, vitamin D actually, and use calcipatriene is actually a very strong immunosuppressant activity. And it, and it decreases T cell responses. So it does numerous things, and it's very, very complex. But one of the things that we know it does, it increases cathocytin. In certain cases, it downregulates immunity, such as you see with calcipatriene. Maybe our UV light, when we put our patients in, it's decreasing inflammation through T cells. But it, but it is very complex, and I don't recommend repeated damage and, and it's like sun, like tanning beds, sure. yeah. as, we, as we know. So, so not know. linear, not a linear correlation. No, not a linear <laughs> correlation. It's more more complex than nuanced. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you.